Well, let's come in prayer as we ask the Lord to help us as we consider this uh, further aspect of salvation tonight. Father, we thank you that uh, we do have that great salvation as uh, the writer to the Hebrews termed it. And Lord, we don't fully appreciate all that you have done for us or all that is involved. And Lord, even after spending, this will be the fourth time that we've looked at this matter. Lord, I don't think for one moment we finally grasped everything. So, Lord, we pray that you will bless us tonight as we consider these things together. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Right, will you turn to, uh, with me to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death, There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the springs of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But for the cowardly, and unbelieving, and abominable, and murderers, and immoral persons, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Then one of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls full of seven last plagues, came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to the great and high mountain, and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper. It had a a great high wall with twelve gates, And at the twelve gates, uh, uh, um, and at the uh, gates were twelve angels. Names were written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on on the west. And the wall of the city had twelve foundation stones. And on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. One who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to the city and its gates and its walls. And the city is laid out as a square, and its length is as great as its width. And he measured the city with a rod, 1,500 miles. Well, that's not a literal translation. It's actually 12,000 stadia. And I wonder if we're not better sticking with that, because 12 is the number of election and it would imply thousands of elect, as it were, involved. And I think that's uh, far more realistic, really. I'm not sure that we have to take it literally. Uh, but uh, certainly we understand that it is the, the chosen, the elect of God, those who have come to know him, who will be part of that. And he measured its wall, 72 yards according to human measurements. But again, it's 144 cubits, which if your maths is any good, is 12 times 12. Again, the number of election there. I think, again, that's far more, uh, we should not take it as, as is translated here. I think it should be a literal translation, really. The material of the wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundation stones of the city uh, wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. Well, then it describes them, and it talks about, And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. And I saw no temple in it, 
For the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun or the moon or, uh, to shine on it. For the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. In the daytime, for there will be no night there, its gates will never be closed, and they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it, and nothing unclean, and no one who has practiced abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Like Ashley said this morning, there are some things we don't fully know and uh, the various different uh, interpretations to these things. But uh, uh, one thing is quite clear, the glory of the Lord will indeed be in that city. But we've been looking at uh, what salvation is and this is actually the fourth uh, time we've been looking at it. Um, We've up to now looked at the matter of uh, that past salvation, what God did for us when we came to know the Lord. Uh, Last time we saw what the Lord is continuing to do, and tonight we're going to look at what lies in the future, because there is a future aspect uh, to our salvation. Uh, If we consider the past, uh, the things that we've looked at, that we've been rescued from the dominion of uh, Satan and been brought into the kingdom of his beloved son, what a transformation that is. Uh, And then we've been redeemed or ransomed, The debt of sin has been cancelled, that's what redemption was about, but coming into liberty, and particularly that liberty which is in Christ, so that something of the power of sin is broken. We saw something of that under that matter of being redeemed. We've been reconciled to God when we were alienated from Him. We've certainly been pardoned, and what a tremendous debt we've had forgiven us. Uh, We've been made alive in Christ when we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And not only alive, uh, we have come to be alive with uh, the Holy Spirit in us. But we've been seated with him in heavenly places. We've come into a heavenly dimension, even if we're not in heaven. Just because the Spirit of God is particularly with us. And we have a different uh, view on life. It's almost as if we are seated up there with him. Because we see things differently now particularly uh, differently to the world. And then we were adopted into God's family. What a marvellous thing that is too, to actually know that we have a Heavenly Father who cares for us. And then last time we were thinking about the present work of uh, salvation. We're to work out our salvation. We're to grow with respect to salvation. Uh, A couple of scriptures that we looked at. So it's an ongoing work. We call it sanctification. Uh, Changing us increasingly. Uh, so that we really do grow more like the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And then we were called to royal service. Those are just some of the things uh, we've touched on. And I think we can only say we've touched on them, because while we've looked at one or two scriptures here and there on these various aspects, uh, there are more than one or two scriptures on most of those things. So it's so rich what God has done for us. But now let's look at the, uh, the whole matter of the future work. Uh, one of the scriptures that we might think of is in Hebrews chapter 9 where it says that Christ will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly wait him so he will appear a second time for salvation we'll look at the details in that verse in a moment Uh, but uh, there very clearly it's pointing to something future he will come a second time For salvation, we know he's coming again. So this matter, this aspect of salvation is to do with the future. And if you uh, look at uh, Hebrews 9, it talks about uh, how Christ uh, offered his life once for all. He didn't need to do it any more than once. It was a complete sacrifice for sin for all time. And uh, it says uh, that he, uh, at the end of verse 26... That uh, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. That's his first coming. He dealt with sin by his death upon the cross. And inasmuch it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment, so Christ also having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin, to those who eagerly await him. What is all of this saying? 
Well, the first thing we might notice from verse 27, that it's appointed for men to die once. After this comes judgment. Once. There is no such thing as um, uh, to, um, reincarnation. Thank you. Yes, that's the word I was looking for. Uh, scripture is very plain. We only have one life. And we have one death. And it's what lies beyond that that is important. After that comes judgment. Even for us as Christians, we have to appear before the tribunal seat of Christ uh, to give an account for what we've done in our lives. And uh, we would hope to gain that reward that he is indeed pleased with the way in which we've served him. But for others, it certainly is a matter of judgment to come. When, as the book of Revelation puts it, they stand before the great white throne of God. And for those who appear then, it will be for... To be cast into the lake of fire. So very clearly it's talking about judgment. That is to await. But for us he's coming for salvation. So that we do not know that judgment. We're delivered from it. He comes a second time not to deal with sin. But to bring us into that heavenly kingdom. If we can put it that way. And then Peter talks about a salvation that is to be ready to be revealed in the last time. It's very much the same idea. That Jesus is going to come again. And there's an aspect of salvation, therefore, that we still wait for. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and uh, uh, verse, well, we'll com- come back to this. It talks about an inheritance in verse 4. And he says uh, that that's reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So there's an aspect of salvation that is uh, laid up for us there. And then he says you may be facing various trials. That's simply testing your faith as to whether it is real or not. Whether you really come to a knowledge of Christ. And then he says that um, uh, though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Obtaining as a result of your faith the outcome of uh, the the, uh, salvation of your souls. In other words, again, we will not face judgment. He will come and we will be delivered. That's part of what salvation is about. Whether it's being delivered from sin now or the penalty of sin to come. So a salvation ready to be revealed when Jesus himself comes. There's something fuller that we enter into as regards salvation. And it's summed up, I suppose, best of all in Romans 5 verse 9. We shall be saved from the wrath of God. It's all to do with the matter of judgment. That for us we're saved from judgment. We will not spend eternity in hell. We will be very much delivered from it. Just reminds us of course again in Romans. That it's not our own effort. It's all because of what Jesus did. That uh, he loved us. And he gave up his only begotten son for us. Even while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Even when we were helpless says the apostle. At the right time, Christ died for us. And though and he goes on and says there, well, not only we will be reconciled by his life, that's part of it. He lived that perfect life. Uh, but uh, in verse 9, much more than having now been justified by his blood. Remember, that's by faith. Jesus died. He paid the penalty for sin. And when we put our faith in him, God counts that as righteousness. So we're justified by faith, but we're justified by the blood of Jesus. It was what he did and not what we have done. And so he says, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. So that final judgment we are delivered from. And then in 1 Thessalonians, as he's speaking again of the second coming of Christ in 1 Thessalonians 5. He talks about us as believers, we're not in the dark. That that day should overtake us like a thief. But he goes on to say, For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Some people like to try to say that we won't go through the tribulation, because tribulation is wrath. 
there's a sense in which there's a measure of truth in that. Because there is something of judgment that will fall upon the ungodly and the nations. Uh, but tribulation is not basically wrath. It's distress. A time of trouble. Of pressure, if you like. Because it almost has the idea of being squeezed in. That's what lies behind the, the word tribulation or affliction. And we see from Scripture that times will get difficult. It's actually so that, in a sense, the nation or the people may look to God and cry out to Him in their distress. And sometimes they do. Sometimes that's the very means by which people are saved. I mentioned before that there was a window cleaner that I met in Cornwall. And uh, he was cleaning windows and he fell from uh, his ladder. And as he was falling, he cried out to the Lord to save him. Marvelously, he saved him not only physically, so that there was no real uh, damage done, uh, but there was a point at which he actually came to know the Lord. Um, the author of uh, Amazing Grace, uh, he actually was caught up in a storm. That uh, slave captain, or the captain of a slave ship. Uh, and John Newton uh, cried out to the Lord because uh, he had not experienced a storm like this. Okay, God saved him physically and spiritually so that he became a great uh, preacher of the gospel. So those times of distress are actually probably to give the last opportunity to the world to turn to him. And actually it does say in the book of Revelation, but in spite of some of these things, they did not repent. It's almost as if all the things they've gone through, God has squeezed out the last person to bring to salvation, as it were. And also in that time, we can lift up our eyes because we know our redemption will draw near. It's one way in which a radiant people looking for the coming of the Lord can be a real testimony to the world. So I believe that we will go through that time. And I believe that God wants us to be there so that we can be a testimony to him. So I think what this is speaking about has got nothing to do with the tribulation. As some would try to interpret it, wrath is always to do with the judgment of God falling upon an ungodly world finally. Uh, so this is what we are saved from. It's a negative side, if you like. But thank God for that. Thank God that we shall spend eternity with him and not know the wrath of God. I might just add, uh, because we've looked at this matter, you know, sometimes when people are preaching the gospel, they think unless it's all blood and thunder, uh, all sin and judgment and hell fire, uh, that they're not really preaching the gospel. But you know, Jesus uh, presented the gospel in other ways as well. Talked uh, about uh, the, the water of life to a woman who was thirsty, looking for some satisfaction in life. And said that if she would only come to him and drink, she would know eternal life. He didn't throw in hell, you'll be saved from it. But he po pointed her to the fact that she would come into the kingdom. And how many times did he bring home something of the idea of being a shepherd? Whether saying he was the good shepherd. Or actually talking about uh, a sheep that had wandered away. And even one he would go after to seek and to... And we've wandered away from God like a prodigal son. He wants to bring us back to him. Again, it's that relationship with God. He invites people to come to him, all who are weary and heavy laden. So don't let's feel we've just got to preach one aspect of the gospel. Jesus preached a very full uh, uh, gospel in so many ways that he had come to... To give them life and to give it more, more abundantly. And actually if you look at the Apostle in the Acts of the Apostles. He's speaking far more about the resurrection that we do. As proof that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah. And they ought to believe in him. So there's many ways of presenting the gospel. We know that in the end of course sin is being dealt with. So that we can come into a relationship with God. And obviously when we're helping people to respond uh, in, say, uh, personal counselling, we always have to show them that sin has broken that, uh, that relationship. But there are many aspects, even in presenting the gospel, let alone many aspects of salvation. Okay. I liked uh, the background to the uh, worship we had earlier because uh, uh, it spoke to me something of the glory that is to be ours. And this is uh, the other side of things. We're saved from the wrath to come, but we're saved for glory. 
And uh, the Apostle Paul said, For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. The glory that is to be revealed to us. Actually, in introducing 2 Corinthians this morning, reminded us in 2 Corinthians 3, or at least I think he did, about the, that light affliction. Uh, momentary light affliction is uh, uh, bearing for our, bringing, will bring for us an eternal weight of glory. The contrast of what we might suffer here and the length and the uh, uh, of glory that we will experience later. So here is Paul saying yes. And here is a man who really suffered for the gospel. But he said you can't really compare with what we're going through now. Compared with what is to come. The glory that is to come. And then in Colossians chapter 3 it says. When Christ who is our life is revealed. Then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Again I'm not sure that we fully appreciate all that is involved in the matter of glory. Again, another verse, it was for this he called you through the gospel, that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. I think we touched on this the other week when we were uh, seeing that he's able to, to keep us from stumbling. Because we saw in that, uh, that passage in 2, uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, that the Antichrist is going to come with all the deception and all the works of the evil one. And many will get caught up in that. But he's saying in effect to them, you were not destined for that. You were destined through the gospel, through Jesus, to gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. I can't start to imagine what it's really like. We've read in Revelation, we'll come to that uh, again. We've got a glimpse of something of that eternal city. But what's heaven like? What's that new earth and new heaven really like? What's glory anyway? The Hebrew word is kafod, uh, which actually basically has the idea of weight or heavy. The Greek word is uh, doxa, from which we de- get doxology, which basically is praise, giving honor, a word of honor of, of glory to the Lord. And I guess it's in between that. Because, you know, in the future, particularly in the millennial reign, it talks about us reigning with him. That has something of honor and yet responsibility. If we have some position of serving him, what an honor to serve him. Might we have that honor now? We've already received something in glory. We've already got the Holy Spirit in us and we've got something of the presence of God now. And yet we don't know, we can't really imagine what it's going to be like. There are glimpses, I suppose. Jesus, when he was transfigured uh, before them, transformed, that splendor of heaven seemed to come upon him in a way that had not been there before. And certainly in the book of Revelation, although probably it's a vision, uh, we certainly see the, the splendor of the Lord shining like the sun at full strength. Well, whether that's partly the vision or whether it's the reality, certainly we know that uh, our bodies will be changed like his glorious body. That means, of course, no more death, no more suffering, no more pain, uh, no more dying. But uh, also in the book of uh, Hebrews, it talks about Jesus as the radiance of the Father's glory. In some ways we're going to receive the glory of the Lord. And the splendor and the presence of the Lord is something to be marveled at. And yet I don't think we can fully appreciate just here on earth what is in store for us as his people. Yes indeed we used to sing the old Sankey hymn and I thought we were going to sing it the other Sunday. I forgot that they, they've changed the chorus in the version that we sang. Oh, that will be glory for me. Just to look upon his face, that will be glory. Be glory for me. To see Jesus in all of his splendor. And to be in a place where the splendor of God, where there is nothing to mar. uh, As Isaiah says, in all his holy mountain. Nothing to spoil. 
That's what we've been saved for amongst other things. That's the future that is laid up for us. The splendors of heaven. The splendors of that new earth and new heaven. One of the things that very much is uh, mentioned in scripture is that we have an inheritance. That's part of our salvation. In fact, in Romans uh, chapter 8 and verse 7, it even talks about us being fellow heirs with Christ. Just think of that. Jesus has an inheritance. All right, in the book, uh, in the letter to uh, the Ephesians, it talks about us being Jesus' inheritance. That in some way we're, we're his reward, we're his possession. His inheritance among the saints is the phrase that is used. But in so many ways, we are going to inherit what Jesus inherits. What he's already inherited in measure, but still the fullness hasn't come. We've already referred to 1 Peter uh, chapter 1. We might go back there, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4, where it talks about us having an inheritance which is undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Blessed be the God and Father, I'm reading for verse 3 now. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith, for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Importance of being protected by the power of God through faith. We need to continue in faith. But there it is, an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and will not fade away. You know, you may have had an inheritance uh, given to you. Uh, I've got an inheritance in our, uh, in our hall, which... Um, I'm not quite sure the family appreciate quite as much as I do, but it's my grandfather's clock. And it's still going since the old man died, I'm pleased to say, although it's had to have one or two repairs. And over the time, it's got a bit battered. Our youngest son, not to mention any name, uh, but he managed to pull all the hands off. And uh, for one of my birthdays, I think Val managed to get it repaired for me. The spring had been broken. So the thing was... It wasn't exactly fading, but time was catching up with it, uh, even although it was a clock, and uh, in the wrong sort of way. And uh, the poor thing was really almost on its last legs. So the inheritance, when it came to me, was good. But it faded somewhat, in some ways. Uh, Val's grandmother left her an inheritance, and her sister's of 100 pounds. Well, uh, in actual fact... £100 when the will was written was pretty good money. Actually, Val's um, mum and uh, her aunt interpreted uh, Grandma's wishes and uh, upped it a bit from the 100 that had been written in the will. They anticipated uh, uh, Val's grandmother's uh, well, desire, really, for, for her grandchildren. But in actual fact, it was the, the inheritance was fading each year. It was getting less and less. Your inheritance does not fade. It does not uh, lose its value. It's of equal value at the time when we die or when the Lord returns. It's imperishable and undefiled. Nothing can spoil it or mar it and will not fade away reserved in heaven for you who are protected or kept by the power of God through faith. Very much linked with that, of course, it talks about an, inter a, a, an eternal inheritance, not an internal one. An eternal inheritance, the same idea. It is there for all time. Well, if you can say eternity has got time, uh, probably hasn't, but uh, you get my meaning. It's, uh, again, it can never be taken away from us. You know that I personally believe that there is a warning in Scripture that we can lose our salvation. But once the Lord has returned, it cannot in any way be removed. For a start, uh, we shall be changed when we see him. So we're not likely to start to doubt him at that point. Uh, we will go on looking to him. Not so much in faith because it will all have become a reality then. 
But there it is, it's an eternal inheritance. And then, of course, we will inherit eternal life. Slightly different, of course, from an eternal inheritance. This is a life that is not only uh, in length, in endurance, as it were, eternal, everlasting, but it's, it's a quality of life as well. Something that we even begin to know now, because whoever believes on the Son has everlasting life. And that is the life of God with us. We become a spiritual being. Beforehand we were just a human being. Jesus said when he talked about being born again, he said that which is the flesh is flesh. That which is of human origin is is just of human origin. But that which is of the spirit is spirit. So we've become a spiritual being. We've got a a relationship with, uh, with our Father. We're reminded tonight that Jesus is actually amongst us as we gather for worship. He's with us tomorrow. He's with you at the washing tub. If you still have a washing tub. Uh, he, he, he's, he's with you when you're doing any amount of chores. He's with you perhaps when your mind is occupied by something else. He's there to help us. And the moment we turn to him, he hears our cry too. So that's part of the life that we have now. But we will know him in a far greater way in his presence. More than anything we've known at the greatest spiritual moment we've had in our lives. So we're going to inherit eternal life. And then we're going to, it talks about inheriting the kingdom. This is in Matthew 25 and verse 34 when it talks about the sheep and the goats. Actually, some people want to translate about as, often, as much as you have done it to one of the least of these my brethren. You've done it to me. Uh, and they interpret that as to how we uh, treat Israel. And whether we're a sheep nation or a goat nation. I can't see it personally. Because actually Jesus said that not even his father and, uh, or his mother and brothers who were there at one point uh, were really his brethren. He said, these are my brethren who believe in me. So I think it's much more about how we we care for one another as part of the family of God. And after all, a whole nation doesn't get into the kingdom of God, inherit the kingdom of God. It's believers who inherit the kingdom of God. So what do we mean by inheriting the kingdom of God? A difficult one. In Daniel 7, it talks there about... uh, the, the, really, the man of lawlessness uh, coming, the man who will make changes in times and laws and will try to wear down the saints of the Most High, it talks about. But it talks then about the kingdom of, of Antichrist will be taken away. Let me uh, read it. Uh, we'll take it from Daniel 7, verse 25. This is talking about the, uh, the Antichrist or the lawless one. He will speak out against the Most High. This is a leader who's going to come and uh, lead the nations astray. And will wear down the saints of the Highest One. And he will intend to make alterations in times and in law. And they will be given into his hand for a time, times and half a time. Uh, We think that's probably three and a half years that it's speaking about. But the court will sit for judgment, and his dominion will be taken away, annihilated and destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all the dominions will serve and obey him. The sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole earth will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. But his kingdom, it goes on to say, is basically his kingdom, but it belongs to us as well. We're going to inherit it. And incidentally, inheritance is given as a gift. It's not wages, not something we have earned. It's given again because of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but it's because of what he has done and because of his death. And the writer of the Hebrews reminds us that uh, we, uh, we have a, an inheritance because of the death of Jesus. The last will and testimony of Jesus, he's almost uh, saying. And as a result, we are going to receive full salvation. But we're going to inherit the kingdom. It's 
It's almost a democracy, and yet a theocracy. He is at the head of it, but we share in it in some way. We will reign with him. But what is more, that reign of God that will come on earth in the millennium reign, and then after the end of that, when everything is uh, uh, thoroughly renewed, and uh, when the devil and his angels are thrown into the lake of fire together with the unbelievers, we will inherit a perfect world where God is reigning supreme. You know, many of us are, are, are privileged, I think, to live in the United Kingdom when we have a, a godly queen and where she has dedicated her, to her life to the service of this nation. And I think she's done an excellent job of it. She has been an example in many ways. Whether you think uh, much of royalty or not. But it's nothing compared with the reign of our Lord Jesus Christ and his God and Father. An absolute perfect realm. Nothing to spoil or mar. No sin. No war. No sorrow. No suffering. But one of absolute peace. When the nations will have beaten their swords into plowshares, where it is peace and not war. Again, I can't fully appreciate all that is involved in that, but in some way we inherit the kingdom. We become partakers in it, and yet involved in it in some way. Fancy God wanting to use us. Fancy God wanting... He even talks about those who overcome, they will sit down on their father's throne as he has sat down on his father's throne. I can't even understand what that will mean, how we will share. But we will be inheriting the kingdom with all the privileges, but all the responsibilities of it in one sense. And then where we were beginning our uh, uh, message tonight by looking in Revelation chapter 21, it talks about uh, we will inherit uh, a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem. It says there in, um, in verse 7, He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. And then again the contrast. But I saw the holy city, verse 2, New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. Even there, you know, when it says about that inheritance that is kept in heaven for us, undefiled and unfading, in a sense, the new heaven and the new earth is there. And all the splendor of those things being made new. And of course it says he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. This planet and the heavens will dissolve with fervent heat, it says. There will be a new earth and a new heaven. And all the splendor of what is involved in that. And then you look at this city. You know, the the splendor of it. I mean, how do you describe it except looking at the most precious uh, materials that you have? Sapphires and diamonds and so on. Although I don't think diamonds are mentioned there, but all the other precious uh, um, gems. And saying, this is the splendor of that holy city. And it's like gold, like transparent glass. Okay, how can you understand that? Gold is something so precious. And yet, like glass, it's transparent. There's nothing opaque, nothing to spoil. You know, even when we look through the windows, particularly after all this rain, you can see all the the dirt on it because some of the, uh, well, we know all the warm weather has come up from the, uh, the Sahara, basically. And with it is the, the dust that gets caught up in dust storms. And sometimes, and particularly in Israel, you see it very much when there's been uh, a humsing, uh, that's the, the, the desert uh, um, clouds coming in, the do- a desert uh, storm really, sand coming in, and then it rains and the cars look really muddy. But we look through our windows now, and certainly ours need cleaning, I don't know about yours. But there was nothing unclean in this city. Absolutely precious and pure. 
But God himself will be in the midst of it. And he will be in this city, the splendor of God. There were glimpses through Israel's history when the the presence of the Lord was so real. Whether it was that Shekinah cloud and pillar that went with them. Or when the glory of God entered the temple when it was dedicated at Solomon's time. But the splendor of God will be in that city. And we will be in that city. This is the future aspect of salvation that we look forward to. Nothing to spoil in all his holy mountain. As Isaiah put it and I've already mentioned. And of course we will drink from the water uh, of life and uh, the tree of life will be there. But there will be no need for a light because God himself will be the light. Again, you know, how can we fully appreciate all these things? In this revelation, something is given to us of the splendor that is to be yet revealed for the people of God. Indeed, that will be glory, be glory for us when we come into his presence. I've tried very inadequately tonight to try to show what God has in store for us in the coming days. I've certainly tried and struggled really over four uh, messages to bring home to us uh, just the fact that we have been saved. And all that God has done, it's much more than just feeling that our sin has been forgiven. He had so much more To do in that deliverance and that salvation. We are being saved at this point in time. God is working out that salvation in us. But we will be saved in the future. And boy we haven't really got a clue as to all the splendor of it. God has revealed as best our minds can grasp. In this revelation and other passages of scripture. So when God seeks to save us. It isn't just concern about saving our souls, but cancelling sin and its power, transforming your life now, granting you his grace and power as we live out life now, calling you into royal service, and bringing you at last into a perfect universe. The likes of which we've never seen or even understood. You know, there's this verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. It says, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard, and which not have entered into the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. It actually goes on to say, but that has been revealed to us by the Spirit. Yes, it has been revealed by the Spirit, but I think we're still staggering trying to understand it all. But I hope as we've gone through uh, looking at the matter of salvation And uh, I think there's so much more I could have said. And uh, no doubt we will be saying from time to time. Really, when the writer to the Hebrews says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? That's almost an understatement, isn't it? But he's obviously seeing this. This salvation is absolutely stupendous. It's far beyond our, our imagining. But Jesus came to bring you full salvation. To deliver you from sin and its power. To transform your life into the likeness of Jesus. That image of God being restored. Of all his grace being poured out. Uh, Ashley touched upon it this morning. I think probably next Sunday I'm going to jump in quickly with 2 Corinthians 8 9. Because it's one of those God is able. And I better get there before Ashley does. Uh, but then we'll have a double blessing when Ashley gets to it anyway. But, you know, what God is wanting to do for us, even now, let alone what is in store for us uh, in the future. I feel I've dealt with this very inadequately tonight. May the Spirit of God reveal something more of it to us as perhaps we ponder it uh, afresh in the days to come. Well, let's pray anyway. Father, how can the likes of our minds fully grasp all that you have in store for us? And yet, Lord, we've known something. We've known a touch of your hand upon our lives. And when that is the case, it causes us to sing in praise to you. And Lord, we know that there are times when perhaps you correct us and discipline us because you're trying to create the likeness of Jesus in us. 
And Lord, you called us now to royal service, to be a royal priesthood, to be a people for God's own possession, to declare, uh, proclaim your excellencies. You brought us out of darkness into light. Lord, we thank you that once we were not a people, but now we're the people of God. But Lord, what is in store for us? Thank you, Lord, that you've given us glimpses. Thank you, as it were, a little bit of heaven has been opened up and we get a glimpse through, just as John did in that book of Revelation. But Lord, even then we we struggle with it, whether we take it literally as being uh, 25 miles high or whether it's more in terms of the elect of God. But what we do know, Lord, is that city will be absolutely glorious. Lord, Jerusalem... You've probably heard me say before, Yerushalayim means a pair, actually. The aim on the end means a pair. It's not just a plural, it's a pair. And the earthly Jerusalem is, as it were, twinned with the heavenly one. But the earthly is nothing like the splendor of the, the heavenly one. And yet, Lord, there were times when your presence was known very real there in, in Jerusalem of old. Particularly when your son walked to the earth. But what will that new Jerusalem be like? Lord, we give you thanks tonight that uh, you have given us a glimpse. But most of all, we thank you that you've saved us. And all that is involved in that salvation, we praise your holy name. Amen.